God is good to us. Oh, thank you, Lord. Well, let's go over tonight to the book of Acts, chapter 7. Do you got a little bit of time tonight? Not going to dock me because of the offering, right? I might have went a little over. When the time of the promise comes, when the time of the promise comes, that's what I want to minister on tonight. And uh, as I was looking at this the other morning, I was studying Acts chapter 7, and I came across these verses. And uh, I've heard many men and women that I have great respect for over the years make statements along these lines, and they're right. I'm not disagreeing with them. But they've, they've made statements about how, you know, very often what people do is they quit right before the manifestation or they draw back, or they, they slow down. Well, you have to understand something. Time is so important in the kingdom. You cannot mismanage your time. You can't afford to waste time. But hear me, you can't circumvent time. Time is involved. Amen. Uh, as I said, uh, my grandson's being born the, tonight. And uh, uh, might already be here. I don't know. But uh, in any event, uh, Pastor Michelle was talking to our daughter-in-law the other day. And she was telling her, she said, I am, just, I am so ready for this baby to come. But do you know that baby didn't start showing signs of arriving till the ninth month? Right? When, when you're carrying a child, you want to carry that child to full term. Why? That child's growing. That child's developing. Am I right? Not giving you a, a, a physiology lesson, I'm, I'm just saying, right? Child is growing, developing. There are different stages that that child's developing in. The first month, this is developing. The third month, this is developing. You can't circumvent time. If you circumvent time... That, that, that is a breach. That is an aborted period of time. And something is underdeveloped. Right? You may be in a position tonight you're saying, when God, I'm telling you when, when the time of the promise comes. God is not making you wait. But there is an appointed season that we enter into when the promise shows up. Notice in Acts chapter 7, this is probably the greatest New Testament evangelistic message ever. Stephen, we only have record of him preaching one message and he got killed for it. But boy, it was a good one. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And it was more than I'm glad Jesus left Capernaum. <laughs> Hallelujah. But boy, it was good. And he said in Acts chapter 7, and we'll begin in verse 5. Now this, remember, he's talking about the promise that God made to Abraham. And when he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees, and it says he gave him none inheritance in it, in the land, not so much to set his foot on. Here's what it means. Abraham had no deed to the land. God brought him to the land that he was going to give him and his descendants, but he never gave him a parcel of ground and said, here, this is yours, you have a deed to it. Notice, yet he promised that he, everybody say he promised. He promised, he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and they should bring them into bondage, and entreat them evil, notice, four hundred years. Abraham had no deed to the land. He had the promise that God would give the land to him and his seed. But he had no deed. Look at verse 7. 
And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. So notice God promised Abraham that after his seed went into bondage that he would deliver them. Is that right? Notice verse 17. Here it is. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. When the time of the promise drew nigh, or when the time of the promise came, there are promises that God has made for a specific time. A specific time. And when the time of the promise comes, we will see the manifestation. But I've got to be patient for the time of the promise. Now listen, our confession plays a role in this and our declaration, but here's what I've learned. My confession, my confession cannot necessarily speed up my growth. I'm declaring what God said. I'm declaring the promise. But when there are things that have been promised to you, my declaration is what God said is what's going to come to pass. And now God work in me whatever needs to be worked in me so I'll be ready when the promise shows up. I don't want to miss the promise because of a lack of preparation on my part. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, anybody ever been around somebody like this uh, in your family? And, and if this person is sitting next to you, just stare straight ahead. <laughs> they know you're going on a trip tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, we're leaving. Right? I'd like to be on the road by 7. They get up at 6. What are y'all laughing at? <laughs> Amen. Nothing is packed. Well, I had to decide what to take. Well, you had two weeks. The promise was nigh, and the bags were not packed. So therefore, <laughs> my goal was frustrated. Amen. Amen. You don't want to get to the time of the manifestation of your promise without what needs to be worked in you having been worked. Are you following me? Amen. We cannot rush time. We, we can't rush the time. We can delay the time. Amen. I say amen. amen. You can't rush the time. And, and here's what I've learned over the years. God's working something in me during that time. There are things that God's taken our fellowship in, in, into and things that He's taken our churches into and there's something He's working in me and my wife right now and you can't get in a hurry. There are things that it has taken 20 plus years to get us in a position to receive. God wasn't withholding. God was not holding back. God wasn't holding anything back. It was a preparation time for, for me to get into a position to receive what God wants to bring into our life. You can't rush that. I've said over the years to ministers over and over, over and over again, preparation time is never lost time. When God has you preparing to go somewhere and preparing to move into something, but I see it, I know what God wants me to move into, but are you ready to move into it? Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, when the time of the promise comes, I'll be ready. Amen. Listen, 
when the Lord asked me to go into the full-time ministry, why did God not ask me to go into the full-time ministry 12 months before he did? I wasn't ready. It wasn't that I couldn't preach. I'm a good preacher. Amen. <laughs> what are y'all laughing at? <laughs> and you what? You're the best preacher. Yeah, thank you. Hallelujah. Give that man a donut. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. Why didn't God call me to pastor a year before he did? I wasn't ready. I mean, my Lord, y'all think I would have not, y'all think I knocked heads when I first started pastoring here. Lord, if you'd have got me when I was a year more immature, there probably wouldn't be a building here today. <laughs> Amen. I wasn't ready. But when the time of the promise came, he said, I need you to step off your job on this date. I was in a position to believe him. Something had been worked in me that led me to know that if God's asking me to do it, I can step off my job and never miss a beat. Right? But if, if God's dealing with you about something along those lines, you don't want to just sit back and wait for it to show up. There's something you've got to start doing in your life. There's something you've got to start pressing into because the time of the promise is going to show up. And if I'm ready, I'll walk into it. I have a friend of mine uh, in Little Rock, good friend of mine. And uh, I preach for him, he preaches for us. And long story short, he was telling me the other day about when God began to talk to them about full-time ministry. He said, what we started doing was believing God for our, for the lowest bill we had was our water bill. And we started believing God to pay it. And he said, when we got our faith to that level to pay that, then we moved to the electric bill. And then we moved to this. And then we moved to the apartment rent where we were. And then to the house note. Amen took it by stages, and when it was time to step over into the full-time ministry, they're ready. What has God promised you? Now think about it. And will you be ready? Because there's things God's working in me right now. There's things God's working in you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Am I helping you? Notice verse 19. The same, that king that did not know Joseph dealt subtly or sneaky or craftily with our kindred, evil entreated our fathers. They cast out the young children to the end that they might not live. In which time Moses was born, was exceeding fair, nourished up in his father's house three months. When he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Notice something very quickly. It doesn't say God spoke to him or that God led him to do that. It says it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Killed him, right? For... The, the word there is now. Now, he supposed. Now notice that very carefully. He supposed. God doesn't suppose. If somebody asks you something and they say, hey, you come to church tonight, and you say, oh, I don't know, I suppose. What does that mean? Maybe, maybe not. Is, is that what it would mean to you? He supposed. He thought. That what? Notice that his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Can you show me that in the Amplified Bible? I want you to see this concerning his thought process. He dealt treacherously, defrauded our race. Uh, verse 25, please if you would. He expected his brethren to understand God was granting them deliverance by his hand, taking it for granted that they would accept him, but they didn't understand. 
Why didn't they understand? The time of the promise wasn't there yet. There are even people that God has predetermined should be a part of what He wants you to do that will be there to aid you and help you, but if you get ahead of the promise, you'll get ahead of them. Amen. Do you see this? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Moses simply got ahead of God. And in doing so, he delayed the promise. How do we know? Look at Genesis or Exodus 12. Excuse me. Exodus 12, verse 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Does it say 430 years? Look at Genesis 15. Oh, glory. Glory. You're going somewhere tonight. Genesis 15 and 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be stranger, a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Is that what it says? But yes, Scripture says they were there 430 years. What was God's plan? 400 years. How long were they there? Now people will say, well, you know, yeah, but you know, 30 years in the, in, the, in the context of 400. Now wait a minute. But what if you miss the plan by 30 years? Right? Ever how old you are. If you're 20 and you miss the plan by 30 years, then you don't walk into it till you're 50. How many years did you lose? How much is God not going to be able to do because I missed the plan? The plan of God is predestined. The plan of God is foreordained. The plan of God is already there. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says that there are pathways that God foreordained that I'm supposed to walk in. What's my, plan, what's my part in the plan of God? Discovery. My job is to discover the plan. The plan's already there. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. God is not making this up as He goes along. Am I helping you? He, he's, he's not figuring it out. He, you weren't born on the planet and He went, Oh man, there's one I missed. i got to figure out a plan for them. The moment you came into this people planet, there was a plan waiting on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And some people get into it early. Some people don't. But ever how long it is till you got into it, once you get into it, just walk it out and the promise will show up. Oh, glory. Amen. Are you following me? There was a guy on TBN one time, and he was an older man. Well, back then he was, I, you know, probably many, many years ago, he was 70 years of age. And, you know, I remember before I was uh, not as close to 60 as I am that I thought 70 was old. <laughs> Somebody would say, you're 70, you're like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right? Now you're, you know, as old as I am, you're like, yeah, it's not bad. Just good and seasoned. Amen. But he said something at that time he was in his 70s and they actually had Jesse Duplantis on there. And they were wanting Jesse to give his testimony when he was a rock star and, and, and you know, living in sin. And, uh, and uh, he, said, uh, he said, I told him, I said, you know, we really ought to be listening to this man. Because the man said this. He said, uh, well, he said, my testimony is this. I'm really a novice to sin. Because I'm 70 some odd years old and I've been born again since I was three. 
Man, that struck me when I heard that. A novice to sin. He got in God's plan early. I say he got in God's plan early and stayed with it and made an impact on the world. Are you following me? When you look at the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul said he was called to do what God asked him to do from his mother's womb. Yet he did not do what God wanted him to do till he was well into his adult years. But when the time of the promise came, he was ready. Do you see this? If, if, if I miss this, then I miss what God's trying to move me into. Because everyone under the sound of my voice, you have a plan for your life. You have something that God wants you to do. For some, it's preaching and teaching. For others, it's singing. For others, it's helps. There are people in here, God has foreordained that you write books. For other people, there are God, God has foreordained that you do certain things in the kingdom. Here's the process. Find out what the plan is. Get in it. Because the promise is attached to the plan. Amen. Sometimes we do our children a disservice and we tell them, well, you can be anything you want. No, you can't. That's right. You need to be pushing after what God wants you to be. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Because if, you, if a person goes after what they want, they can miss what God wants. Yeah. Amen. We're not going to miss it. Say out loud, I'm not going to miss it. Tell them, I'm not going to miss it. Glory be to God. Well, Pastor, I wish I'd have got involved earlier. Well, but you got involved as soon as you could. Amen. Amen. It's kind of like people used to ask me. They say, were you born in Texas? No, but I got here as quick as I could. Amen. <laughs> Hallelu Hallelujah. Hmm, hmm. So God told Abraham they would be in bondage 400 years. Well, God wasn't wrong. And he didn't miss it. Moses got in a hurry. Amen. God is a God of order. Am I right? Look, look at the universe that we live in. Despite what some people believe. The universe is expanding at 186,000 miles per second. The speed of light. I, I'm told that in the Milky Way galaxy alone, there are billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of planets, moons, and, and other things. I'm not an astronomer. I can't tell you. How does that all work? We have a God of order. He planned it. Right? Amen. When God plans something, God is a, is a, a planner. We can't afford to waste time, but we can't circumvent it. Um, in this body, I'm limited by time. Time is my limit. That's why in the book of Psalms, David said, Lord, teach me to number my days so I'll know how much time I have left. Teach me to pay attention to every year that's passing and am I at this moment, am I getting done what you want me to do? Am I in the plan you want for my life? Am I pushing towards it? Am I allowing you to work in me what you want to work in me? Is my heart being set towards what you want? Is my mind on what you want? Am I thinking along that line? Never ever can you allow yourself to just go through life without giving the plan of God for your life thought and consideration because the promise is attached to it. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. When, and I've told this story before, praying on a Monday night. And the Lord spoke to me. I'd been here five years. And he said, how long? He, first of all, he said, uh, you weren't my first choice. He said, you were third on the list. He said, how many years were the two ministers here before you? I said, Lord, five, respectively. He said, what does five represent? I said, the number of grace. He said, exactly, I gave each of them five years to do what I asked them to do, and they wouldn't do it. And then remember what he asked me? He said, now, I've given you five years. Will you do it, or do I need to get somebody else? That's what he said to me. 
And I said, nope, don't look any further. I'll get it done. Right? Now, now think about this for a moment. Were they not good people? No, good people. Good men. What was the difference? Somebody wouldn't get with God's plan. And if you don't get with God's plan, the promise can't come to pass. Amen. Amen. Do you know when Moses stood by the burning bush, do you realize he had a choice? He didn't have to go back. Why? Because God, God, God doesn't make anybody do anything. He never made anybody do anything in the Old Testament or the New Testament. He can direct and ask and request, but i got to get in the plan. But what he will say is, if you do this, I'll do this. I want you to go back, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And let me tell you how it's going to go, Moses. He's going to refuse. Right? And, by the way, I'm going to visit that nation with, with, with plagues, and we're going to bring them to their knees, and he's going to let y'all go. Right? And this is what you're going to do. Think about that. Moses, Moses said, I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm a man that's slow of speech. And God said, okay, no problem. Here comes Aaron. He can talk for you. Right? You see how bad God wanted Moses to get in his plan? Do you see that? God, God will make a way past all your excuses to get you into his plan. I'm, I believe I'm helping you. Do, do you see that? And finally, when he went back and got in God's plan, the promise showed up. Right? And they came out of bondage. They came out 30 years late. But they came out of bondage. Now notice something in Mark chapter 4. We can't afford to waste time, but we can't circumvent time. Tell your neighbor, I'm going somewhere. I'm telling you folks, you need to hear my heart tonight. Everything that's come up on the world, the enemy is using it to make people lazy. He's using it to make people back off. He's using it to make people lackadaisical. People are not pressing into things because after all, look at what all's going on. Listen, in the middle of the greatest persecution the church had ever seen, it grew by leaps and bounds. The church has never been led to hide and just ride things out. We are always a force to be reckoned with in whatever station we find ourselves. Hallelujah. Mark 4 Verse 26, and he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He does not know how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest, we could say the promise, is come. Now notice something. In order to harvest the promise, we have to be patient. The blade, the ear, the full corn in the ear. The blade and the ear are evidence that the promise is coming to pass. I see it. How many right now, you see the blade in the ear in some areas in your life? Raise your hands if you see it. You see the blade in the ear. Well, guess what? Listen to me. The full corn in the ear is coming. Don't get impatient. I say don't get impatient. Hallelujah. When, if you grow tomatoes, the rest of you grow tomatoes? You do, don't you? It, well, 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 there's a process, right? And, and when you go out there at some point, you see some little green tomatoes. Well, you don't pull them off there, do you? No, they're not ready. Right? You want to wait till they're big and red. Because then they're ready. Now that sounds like a simple explanation. But Jesus is telling us that this is how it works in the kingdom. First the ear, the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. And he said when the full corn in the ear shows up, then he puts in the sickle. Because the time of the harvest has come. Amen. 
Yeah, but I'm, I'm tired of waiting. Well, quit waiting and grow. If, if you look at it while I'm just waiting, then you're missing something. Listen, I learned something years ago, traveling a lot like I travel. And, 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 and of course, before uh, this year, I used to travel a lot more by air. But I, I've learned something, <laughs> especially when you travel a certain airline, and I'm not going to mention it, but it has two A's in its name. And uh, in any event... <laughs> They, 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 they are the world's worst at, at five minutes before you get ready to get on your plane. Ladies and gentlemen, the flight to such and such has been delayed and you are now moved to gate such and such all the way across the complex. You better hurry or you'll miss your plane. They don't really say that, but you understand. Well, then you get there and it's delayed. So I've learned, always take work with me, always take projects with me, write on a book, plan things for the church. Why? Because I can be like so many people that just sit there and, and waste time and veg out, right? And sleep, or I can get something done. Waiting and patience are two different things. Patience is how you wait. And when you see the blade, oh my goodness, something's happening. That's right, something's happening. The promise is growing. Oh, now I see, I see the ear. I know, but it's not the full corn in the ear. Patience. Say patience. I will not get the full benefit of the promise if I harvest too early. Yeah, but what about my time? Don't worry about your time. Your time, your, listen, your time, the Bible says our times are in the hands of God. He knows just when to bring us on the scene. Do you realize John the Baptist did not show up one day before he was supposed to? Where was he at the whole time? In the wilderness. Out of sight. Nobody saw him. Nobody knew what he was doing. But the time of the promise showed up and he came on the scene declaring, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Am I right? And he ministered that for we don't know how long. And one day he looked up and there came Jesus walking along the side of the river Jordan. And he said, that's why I'm here. Look there, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Right? How long did he have to be patient? Years, right? But did the promise show up? Amen. Now, notice over here in Hebrews 10, while, while I'm waiting, God's working things in me. Now, remember, I'm, I'm, when I say I'm waiting, remember we're not talking about crushing or dark times, or silent times, or wilderness experiences. Remember I told you I'm writing that book, The Myth of the Wilderness Experience. It's a myth. People say, well, you know, God works something in you in the wilderness. Here's the problem with everybody that went through the wilderness. They died. They, they never got it. God doesn't bring you through the, God, God doesn't take you to the wilderness to cause you to get a greater anointing. Jesus didn't get a greater anointing in the wilderness. He went in a greater anointing to the wilderness. And he needed that anointing to defeat the devil. And he defeated the devil and came out of the wilderness full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hebrews 10, verse 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence which have the great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Don't cast away. Don't fling away your confidence. This is our confidence that God will do what He said. Don't fling it away. It's, it's like taking a coat off and just throwing it away. Don't do that. Why? Because notice what He says. You have need of patience that after you've done the will of God. Doing the will of God requires patience. Doing the will. In, in, in whatever area it may be. 
And, and, and we can talk about very elementary things. We've talked about the call of God on a person's life. That the call of God on people's life is progressive with a narrowing goal. Meaning that it starts off with different things. I've held every position in the local church. I've been an usher. I've been a youth pastor. I've been a children's pastor. I've ran the sound. I've played the drums. I've played the guitar. I've sang. I've done it all. Well, there was a time I was doing all those things. But every, every season, it got more and more narrow to what God called me to do. God never called me to play the drums. He never called me to play the guitar or to sing. I can do all those things, but that's not my calling. This is my calling. But if you don't wade your way through some of those things and do the will of God and be patient, you won't get to the promise. Well, I just think there's more for me to do. There is, no doubt, there is. What's, what's going to get you there? Patience. Right? And God will show you glimpses of it. Snapshots. They'll, they'll ask you to take the offering, and boy, that anointing will come on you. And you know that's what you're called to do. Amen. And then you get done, you come out of, out of the pulpit, and the pastor says, here, we need you to help vacuum. Yeah, but I was just so anointed. I know. You'll be real anointed to run that vacuum. Right? Anybody here ever hear of David Crank, David and Nicole? Amen? Good people. And uh, he was talking about uh, 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 some things in his life that, 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 that God would send great men of God to his father's church and prophesy over him that you're not always going to be in the shadow of your father, that your season's going to show up and you're going to make an impact on the world and you're going to do these things. And he said those prophecies would come forth and my dad would say, he said his dad would say this, he'd say, oh boy, he said, you're not ready to do anything. Get out there and get that parking lot repaved talking about preaching. You're not ready to preach. Well, maybe he could see it. Maybe he couldn't. But here's the point. What he was talking about was I had to be patient to do what I was doing because I had a promise that God said was coming my way and I had to do the will of God to get to the promise. Am I helping y'all tonight? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, what's the will of God? In, in, in most times, in your formative years, it's whatever your hand finds to do. Amen. I've had people say these things. They would come to church and we'd say, hey, we'd like you to get involved in this. Oh, no, that's not what I'm called to do. Well, they thought they knew what they were called to do, but they didn't know what they were called to do. And bar none, unequivocally, without exception, every person I've ever seen say something like that is doing nothing for God today. Amen. Amen. Why? Because there's things God's going to work in you. Amen. Amen. I've told people for years, and those of you that have heard me teach on children's ministry, I've told people for years, if you can't teach to kids, you can't teach to anybody. Because here's what people say, well, i got a teaching gift, i got a preaching gift, you know, I'm called to the adults. Well, if you, if, if you can't humble yourself and preach to kids, you're not ready to preach to adults. God's working something in you. If you can't get back there and lead kids into worship, how are you ever going to come out here and lead adults into worship? When the Bible says you've got to become like a little child to even enter into the kingdom of God. Well, you know, I, I wanted to get involved, but all they need is a camera operator. So that, I mean, is that, that's what? That's below you? That's, that's below your pay grade or what? It's an opportunity to spread the gospel. Right now, Buzz is spreading the gospel. Amen. Amen. Who else back there? Why? Why? And who else? Abby. Abby. They're spreading the gospel. Amen. Right? Amen. Will they always be back there? Don't think so. But think about this. The promise is coming. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, the promise is coming. Hallelujah. I got to do the will of God. Yeah, but this is a hard time right now. I understand. Do the will of God. The hard times get easier when you do the will of God. Amen. Amen. 
I remember years ago. Am I helping y'all? I remember years ago. This, this whole thing came into vogue to stop having midweek service. Years ago. Back at the beginning of the sneaker friend, I mean seeker friendly movement. <laughs> and, and the big thing was to quit having midweek service. And oh man, I wrestled with that. Whew. And I'll tell you why I was wrestling with it. Because I had midweek service one night and like six people showed up. And most of them were ushers. I had like four ushers and two people. Now that's an exaggeration, but you understand. And one Wednesday night I came out and there was eight people. And about three of them were asleep. Oh man, I was questioning the, the will of God. Now I know that's a simple thing, but you got to understand. Um, Lord, I don't feel confident in not having service. What do I need to do? You know what I had to do? I had to just get up here and preach to those eight like there were 80 or 800 or ever how many there was because that was the will of God. And many of you that have been here through the years, you will attest that Wednesday nights became one of our best services. And Wednesday nights are still great. But here's the point. you got to do the will of God. The promise shows up when you do the will of God. But I want to do this, and, and I want to pastor, and I want to do this, and, and I want to prophesy, and I do the will of God. The promise shows up when you do the will of God. Mm. After we have patiently done the will of God, we receive the promise. That's important. I remember my pastor telling a story. And uh, uh, they were traveling. They were in traveling ministry, of course. Him and Miss Jeannie and, and their son. And they traveled around uh, teaching and preaching and, and singing. And long story short, they were, they were actually in Southern California. They were in Ed Dufresne's house in the basement. And he said, I was praying there one day. And the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to go back to Little Rock, Arkansas, and I want you to raise up a spiritual production center producing life, city, state, nation, and world that will touch your city and the world. Was that God's plan for him all along? Yes. But yet when he got born again and got saved... God told him, he said, I want you to take a year off your job and spend every day in your, in your office studying. And he said, and here's why, because you don't know anything. Right? He said, I got people I want you to touch, but nobody will listen to you right now because you don't know nothing. Was the plan of God for him to touch the world? Why didn't he just jump out there and start touching the world? Because he didn't know nothing. What was the will of God? Go in your office and study for a year. Then after studying for a year, he said, okay, now what? And God put him in, the, in traveling ministry. And they traveled around in the 70s and, 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 and taught and sang. Well, well, why didn't God just move them back to Little Rock, Arkansas? They always lived there, but back there uh, uh, to start a church. They weren't ready. I know that sounds elementary, but if you can get people to understand that when you're ready and things have been worked in you that need to be worked in you, God will bring the promise to pass. Don't get in a hurry. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's just say they did it. Amen? And here nearly, well, it's, it's probably over 40 years now. And that church is still there. And it's still touching the world. And it's still touching the city. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now notice this. Am I helping you? Many never do the will of God because they get in a hurry and miss the time of the promise. Many never do the will of God because they get in a hurry and miss the time of the promise. This is what bothers me about people that just walk away from where God told, they say God told them to be. It bothers me. Because I, and you, say, you, you can think of this what you want. I've never seen anybody do that and do better. 
ever. Amen. When someone comes and says, oh, God changed my life in this church. God delivered me. God set me free. Then, then what they should be saying is I could never just walk away. But there will always come a time when I'll have to be patient where the plan of God is concerned to inherit the promise. Amen. Amen. Look at Galatians 6. Now this is a familiar scripture, but I want you to see this. Because we're going to talk about what the Lord has said to us about this fellowship in this church. Galatians 6 and 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season... We shall reap if we faint not. That word do, it literally means your own season. Your own season. So what does that tell us? Everybody's got a season. It's your own season. Amen. In due season, the word season means a fixed and definite time. Now words mean what they mean. So that means every person in here has your own fixed and definite time. What's my job? Be ready. Be ready. I remember, and, and, and I'll share this because it's important. I remember when I really began to feel God dealing with me about the call of God on my life on a deeper level. I, I, I've known for... Since I was a kid, I was called to preach. Uh, uh, just knew it. You, I couldn't go into a service that people weren't prophesying over me. I remember me and my mom going into a tent meeting when I was 10 years old, and the man of God was up there preaching, and all of a sudden he stopped in his message and said, Is that your son? She said, Yes. He said, Bring him up here. And I, and I walked up the aisle, and he said, I've called this boy and ordained him to preach the gospel, and I've called him to be a prophet, and I've called him to speak the word of God. And he spoke all these, these things over me. I, I've known this since... I've been born again two years. I got saved when I was eight. Born again two years. And all of these things are going on in my life. I've known this for a long time. Right? Amen. And so, but here's the thing. When God began to deal with me on a deeper level about this, I began to, to ask God, I want what you want for my life. And God began to ask me to do something. He said, I need you to start setting yourself apart. I need you to start focusing on some things. And I read a book by W.V. Grant Sr., not W.V. Grant Jr., W.V. Grant Sr. And it was entitled, Must I Fast 40 Days? And he talked in that book about, now understand why I'm, why I'm using this illustration. He talked about growing in his, in his walk with God in this set apartness. And he said, I fasted three days, and then I fasted seven days, and ultimately 21. And then he said, God asked him to fast 40 days, and he said, must I fast 40 days? Now, I'm not saying there's any power in fasting 40 days, uh, uh, extra power. But it, God laid it on my heart to consecrate myself and go down that road. All right? So I started fasting. I was helping out in a church. I was assistant pastor in a church. And I started fasting. And I started seeking God. And I started setting myself apart because I knew there was something God wanted me to do. I couldn't see it all clearly yet. I couldn't see every aspect of it because here's the thing. Whenever the flesh is clouding my vision and clouding my, 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 my sight, all right, there are things I got to set aside and things I, there's things you got to want more than food. There's things you got to want more than TV. There's things you got to want more than just hanging out. You follow me? And so I made the decision, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm, I'm going to approach it. Now, I'm not giving you a formula. I'm, t I'm telling you about understanding that I had a fixed and definite time that these things were supposed to occur in my life. And I don't want to miss it. Amen. 
And so I'm, I'm going into extended times of, of fasting and prayer. And I knew, okay, when I go to work, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have an hour for lunch. And, and, and of course, I'm not eating lunch. So I took the back seat out of our minivan. And over lunch, I would just go get in the minivan in the parking lot and pray. And just seek the Lord about what He wanted, wanted to do. Man, I'd come out of that minivan soaking wet with sweat. Because, you know, being the summer, and, and I wasn't smart enough to leave the windows down. And so I, I'm just praying up a storm. Amen. But man, something began to change. And the first thing that began to change, two things. My vision got clearer and my sensitivity got greater. If you want to hear God's voice on a more sensitive level about the promise concerning you, there are things you got to put aside and things you got to put away and things you got to enter into. Not just talking to preachers, I'm talking to every believer. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And God began to talk to me. God began to speak to me. God began to move in miracles. I mean, I can't count the number of people that got healed of cancer. The people that got delivered. The people that got set free. I've told you the story. Man, in the middle of that fast, they brought that little boy to church that was allergic to everything. I mean, they showed me the list of what this kid was allergic to. I think he was allergic to air. I mean, it was, it was just, it was horrible. And was on seven different allergy medications. Seven different allergy medications. And none of them were making a difference. And the mother brought him to church. And we laid hands on him and God healed him. She took him back to the doctor the next day. And the day before, he was allergic to everything. And the day after, he has no reactions at all. Amen. Amen. People say, did fasting do that? Fasting provided an atmosphere and a conduit that was free in my life for the power of God to flow through in a greater measure. Am I, am I helping you? Think about that. When a person goes to the doctor and they're having heart problems and they, and they look at their, their heart and they say, okay, you got a buildup in, in this part or in these arteries, right? Well, what do they do? they got to go clean it out. Why? Because blood flowing. Blood is flowing, but it's encountering a blockage. And when it encounters the blockage, what does it cause? Pain and heart failure. When the blockage is removed, the blood is flowing. The vessel is open for the blood to flow through. When you set yourself and you say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to set myself apart, to see God do everything He wants to do in my life, then you become this vessel that says, whatever needs to be taken out of my life, whatever I need to put to the side, whatever I need to quit doing, whatever I need to put away, I'll put it away so the promise can come into my life. Amen. And people will try to talk you out of it. They'll try to talk you out of it. I had the pastor of the church come to my house, came to my house, her and her husband, good godly people, and sat there and tried to talk me out of fasting. Philip, you sure are losing weight. Are you sure? And I looked at her and I, and I called her name and I said, dear pastor, I said, you don't understand. I'm after something that I got to have. I got to have this in my life. And this is what I believe God asked me to do. I'm not preaching on fasting. I'm telling you, doing the will of God. Doing whatever it takes to clear your vision. Doing whatever it takes to open up your spirit to hear what God wants you to hear. There are a lot of people that never hear what God wants them to hear because He's having to compete with every other voice. He's having to compete with every other image. Their mind, their spirit is so clouded with everything else. The problem, the situation, the issues that God can't get the promise to them because that's all they're seeing but when you set yourself apart and you say I'm going to do my part to be set apart and to consecrate myself in whatever area it is then God can begin to move things out of your life and God can begin to move things into your life amen my, I'm telling you what 
My grandkids are going to grow up and they're going to say, I thank God that Paul Paul fasted. I thank God that he fasted and that he prayed and that he sought God. Why? Because you are preparing things not only for you. The Bible says the promise is for you and for your children and as many as who are far off, whoever the Lord God shall call. I'm telling you that right now you are preparing the way for what God wants you to do and you're preparing the way for what God wants your children to do. Don't stop short generations are in the balance. Don't stop. Because the promise is here. Amen. Hallelujah. Am I helping you? There's a fixed, definite time for me to receive. And I've had people say, well, wasn't that hard or isn't that difficult? It depends on what you're going after. If you compare the God's plan for your life and dinner, what's more important? The plan. So it makes dinner kind of non-important. Now remember, I'm not just talking about fasting. I'm talking about anything. Remember I told you one time I was watching a show. I'll tell you what show it was. This is years ago. CSI Miami. Remember? <laughs> Horatio. And I was sitting there one night. And boy, it was coming on. Who are you? Who, 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 who? I really want to know. Don't act like you never listen to them. <laughs> All you young people, that was your mama. <laughs> that was y'all mama. <laughs> Look at Jill and she's like. <laughs> Paula, that, that wasn't me. That was. But I was sitting there, man, I, I'm, I'm getting ready, right? I'm getting ready to watch it. And the Lord said to me, he said, if I ask you to quit watching that show, would you? Then tell me to. He asked me. And I said, yes, sir, I will. Turned it off. Didn't watch anymore. Something changed. God started moving on another level. The time of the promise is here. What are we willing to do to receive it. Now there are people that will teach you all you got to do is receive it. That's true. I do have to receive it, but I have to prepare myself to receive it. Did Mary have to prepare to receive the seed? Yes. She had to say, be it unto me according to your word. Am I right? All, th all through Jesus, three and a half years of his earthly ministry, he was building up to what those apostles and disciples were going to do. Did they have to grow? Did they have to produce fruit? Did they have to become different than they were? Yes, they did. What happened? They became men that the Bible says turned the world upside down. How would you like that said about us? They, they, that Paul and his companions came to Ephesus and they got so upset, they went and drug his buddies out of their house. And they went screaming into the amphitheater. Those men that have turned the world upside down have come here. Amen. Are you following me? I want my name written on that plaque that says they helped turn the world upside down. Amen. Hear me. The Lord said to me today, concerning our churches, concerning our fellowship, three things, three words. This is coming. Expansion. Quicker than ever. Quicker than ever. Things that have seemed to be taken a long time are about to show up. And they're about to expand. I'm telling you, to, for this church, this fellowship, every church in the fellowship, I'm telling you, get ready to expand. 
And, and the, what the Lord showed me was like, uh, 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 one, you remember, the, you, you know those big balloons you used to get, bouncy balloons, you'd put them on a, on a rubber band, right? How they expand. But if you just pick them up, they just say, just look. And, but then you put air in them and they just expand. That's what, that's, that's what God's going to do. Then, secondly, advancement. Advancement. This is not a time to pull back. Not a time to draw back. It's a time to advance. And whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Well, pastor, what's it going to take? I don't know. That's, that's your part. I don't know what it's going to take for you. I'm not, nobody's doing anything wrong. I'm talking about moving forward as a church. Expanding. Advancing. Maybe God will lead you to fast. Maybe God will lead you to do something else. I don't know what God will lead you to do. But here's the thing. Whatever price I'm willing to pay, God will recompense me because of it. Then, this is a word he's never used for me before. Propulsion. Propulsion. It's coming. Amen. And, and what he kept saying in my spirit is it's like a car with a turbo. You can be going down the road at a certain speed, and the whole time you're doing that, that boost is working. I said that boost is working. And when it comes time to hit it, you're going to hear, and you're gone. There's a lot of things. Mark my words. You do whatever you want to do with this. There's a lot of things that have been running neck and neck with you. But in the spirit, I hear this. You're about to hit it. Gone. And you know what he said? He said, here's all you got to do. Lay aside the weight. And the sin that so easily besets you. Whatever's weighing you down, lay it aside. Amen. Because the time of the promise is here. For this body, the time of the promise is here. I remember when the Lord asked us to go on television. And the Lord could not have asked us to go on television at a more inconvenient time because He asked us to go on television when the bottom of the economy dropped out in late 2007, early 2008. <laughs> Amen. And God began to deal with us to go on TV. And you know, here's my wife that can just believe God for anything. Telling me what a great opportunity it is. And I'm looking at the numbers. They're as red as Julie's shirt. <laughs> really? Go on TV. <laughs> They'll take one look at those red numbers and they won't let us on anyway. But she had them send the contract. And she said it there on her desk. And she, she made the decision, okay, you know, when, when you think it's right and, and whatever. And man, I would walk by her office and look at that contract and I, would, I knew I needed to sign the thing. Amen. And finally, one day I just went in there and I said, well, all right, let's get the thing done. And I just signed it and we sent it. You know, we've only had one hiccup the whole time we've been on TV and that was when, when we missed God in a certain area and we got that corrected and we've never been late again. Always been on time. God will ask you to do something that looks impossible but it will produce the time of the promise and I'm telling you we're at that time. This fellowship is at that time and, 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 and here's what you got to look past. you got to look past what others may say or what others may declare. Oh, Jesus, I don't want to say that. <laughs> and you got to get the gift of goodbye. Because there are, going to be, there are going to be people that just won't move forward. you got to. Amen. you got to move on. Because that's the time of your promise. I will not let my promise pass me up because I'm waiting on somebody else. Amen. 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 Do, you, do you see it? I say, do you see this? Do you see this? Everything, you mark my words, 
The Lord's been speaking to us prophetically, and he said tonight he was going to do it again. You mark my words. From here on out, everything gets easier. You mark my words. Right, right, right now, it's what? It's 8 p.m. What's the date? The what? 14th of June. Everything gets easier. He said to us this morning, remember what he said to us this morning. He said that you're going to begin to see people the counterfeits are going to be exposed. The liars are going to be exposed. And you're going to see people. He said, you're going to see people that have been speaking lies and speaking counterfeit statements and that they're just going to cease to be relevant. They're going to be moved out of the way, cut off, and cease to be relevant. And he said, one does not have to die to cease to be relevant. But he said, you're going to see it in the next three months. And he said, when you see it, it is a sign to you that everything else I've promised is going to come to pass. It's going to happen. You're already seeing it. There were voices at the beginning of this season that everybody was depending on and you don't even hear of them anymore. I'm going to share this with you. In 2014, how many remember a prophet? He's in heaven today. Remember a prophet named Kim Clement. Anybody remember Kim Clement? This man, in my mind, was one of the most accurate prophets of recent days. He's in heaven today. But he prophesied in 2014. He said this. He said, first of all, concerning our president. He, now, now, remember, our president wasn't even in office yet. This was two years before he was elected. He prophesied that he would be elected. And then he said, they will shout, impeach, impeach. But it will not happen. Then he followed it up with this. He said there will be two terms of a praying president. He will come in praying quietly, but my spirit will come into him and he will leave praying like a lion. He'll roar. Now I'm telling you something by the Spirit of God. I've watched our president grow spiritually. And when I say this, hear what I'm saying. There are times he says things and people think that's just our president talking. That's the Spirit of God talking through him. And you better recognize that and understand it. Because we have spent so many years with lukewarm, fake Christian presidents that just catered to the moral majority and never said anything God wanted said. Our president opened the door for the Spirit of God to begin to work through him when he moved our embassy to Jerusalem and recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He opened up the door for the Spirit of God to begin to move in our nation. And, the, and listen, and the enemy pounced on that because the only nation he hates worse than us is the nation of Israel. And when we begin to recognize them, the Spirit of God begins to operate and the devil gets busy. But I got news for you that the Bible says even if the enemy comes in like like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And you mark my words. I'm telling you this. This prophetic flow is strong in me right now. Our president said something and I heard him say it. And he said, one day you're just going to turn around and that virus is going to be gone. Mark my words. It's going to be gone. It will outlive its usefulness. Amen. Amen. How, somebody say, I believe that. He said in, in 2 Chronicles 20, 20, he said, believe my prophets and you'll be established. Is that what he said? You'll prosper. I'm telling you something. I'm not just talking about what's going on in, in, in the world and the uncomfortableness of it. Listen, I've been too busy preaching. I've been too busy building churches. I've been too, building, too busy fulfilling the vision that God has placed on my life. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what any of the talking heads are saying. I don't know what they're declaring. I know what God's been telling me. I don't have time but to keep my nose in the carpet and my eyes on God and to make a decision that this promise is not going to pass me up. I'm not going to miss what God has for me to do. Father, if it means more, 
more knee time, if it means more pushing back of the plate, if it means more just me and you alone in my study, seeking you, putting my eyes on you, then that's what it takes and that's what I'm willing to do. But the promise will not pass me up. It will not pass me up. Amen. Hallelujah. Because the generations are in the balance. And, and, and we, I, I know I need to hush. We got to do it. We've got to do it. Amen. We've got to do it. And we can't be deterred. And we can't be put off. And we can't be backed down by anything. Amen. Because the greatest days are ahead of us. And I don't mean that in a cliche sense. The greatest days are ahead of us. There are, there are young men and women in here that the anointing of God is just starting to get a place in your life where it's moving you to another place. It's moving you to another level. It's moving you to another, uh, another sphere. And if you'll keep letting that anointing work through you, it'll bring you someplace that you never thought you would be and God will use you in a measure that you never thought was possible. Amen. And all it takes is being there. When the promise shows up, just being ready. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Because, well, thank you, Lord. I'll say that. Because on the other side of this, there's a revival of the word of faith. Because I'm going to keep telling you this. People are finding out that their little tippy-toe religion didn't get the job done. And they're going to come back to the word of faith in great numbers. I'm telling you. Somebody say, I believe that. I believe that. They're, they're going to come back in great numbers. And what you saw in the late 60s, many of us, and through the 70s, and even into the 80s, we're going to see greater. We're going to see greater. And those of us that lived through it are going to say, well, my God, this is like it was then, but on a greater measure. Amen. And, and he'll raise up the young lions. He'll raise up the young lions. He'll raise up the young lions. Amen. Don't you all understand that? If you're a young man or a young woman in here, he said he's given the race to the young men because they're strong. God's placed old men in our fellowship because we have the wisdom and we have the knowledge and we have the understanding and he's asking the young lions to get up and get out of the cave and come get anointed because the same anointing that's on your father and the same anointing that's on your mother is going to rest on you and you are not only going to do what we've done, you will far exceed what we've accomplished and you will far exceed what we've been able to do because the will of God, says the Lord, is for the child to always outdo and go farther than the Father because the foundation is laid strong and sure. So don't be concerned and don't be afraid. The promise is on the way and you will be in a perfect position to receive it and walk it out, says the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 So I tell you like I've told them for years, if you don't feel like you can do it, get on my back, I'll carry you. We're going somewhere. We got things to do for God. Advancement, acceleration, propulsion. It's coming into our life in the name of Jesus. Expansion in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And he told me, I'll finish with this. He told me just yesterday morning, I was, getting, I was, I was up praying, and he said this. I read it to you in prayer meeting this morning. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, 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 the synopsis of it. He said, greater is coming. And he said, when I say greater is coming, I'm talking about a move of the Spirit. And he said, it's going to be greater in quantity and greater in quality. And he said, you're going to see more. You're going to see more signs and wonders. You're going to see more tongues, more interpretation of tongues, more prophecy. He said, all of the nine spiritual gifts, you're going to see them more. That's a greater quantity. And then he said, and it's going to be a higher quality than it's ever been before. And then he said this. He said, so it begins this year and will go into next year. Amen. 
And he said to me, he said, so your part is to keep your part, yourself set apart and to keep yourself full and be ready to do your part. I'm ready. I'm ready. You ready? Ready. Hallelujah. We're ready. And we're, we're going to see it. We're going to see it and we're going to move into it. We're going to see it and we're going to move into it. I say we're going to see it and we're going to move into it. Yes. yes, Lord. And many now, even now, demon spirits are crying out. Because they see in the spirit realm and they see that people are grabbing a hold of this. And they see that many believers are starting to say, this is my time. This is the season that God's called me for. And even some that have been aloof and some that have been cold and some that have been backed away from the things of God for whatever reason. They have picked back up their desire and picked back up their commitment. And many, many, many spirits in the evil realm are crying out. They are getting busy again. They're starting to get busy in the things of God. And even the Lord says in the times when people back off the church that stayed true the gates of hell could not prevail against it and the Lord God says now you just imagine what will happen when everybody's on board Hallelujah. glory be to God Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Woo! Thank you, and I see them I see them I see them in your church. I see them like a garden. And uh, I see different colors. Mm. I, I see different nationalities. I see Hispanic folks. I, I see Asians. Oh, oh. I see dark skin. I see light skin. Mm. They're not going to be able to classify you as a certain kind of church. Mm. And you're going to look out over your congregation and you're not just going to say, my, 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 look what the Lord has done. You're going to feel the strength coming from them. And you're going to feel the weight lifting off of you as they begin to lift up your arms and lift up your hands and declare that God is going to do great things. And there will be people that will come that speak other languages, but they're going to come to your church and they're going to be so inspired by the things of God that they will come and they will sit there and not even understand everything that you're saying, but the anointing's going to speak to them. And from this night forward, you're going to begin to operate in another level of the anointing and it's going to be a level of prophetic unction that breaks in pieces the rock of even most stubborn existence and from this night you will see breaking and loosening and freedom in every service. Glory to God. Thank you Jesus. Well the glory has showed up. Hallelujah. The glory is approval. Hallelujah. 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 Now, 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 don't, 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 don't get upset with me or, or worried. I'm going to observe protocols. But uh, if you are uh, under 20 in here, stand up. Under 20, stand up. Just, I mean, I mean all the way down to the little ones. Please. If you're under 20, stand up. Y'all standing up? Why, Abby, y'all standing up? Buzz, sit down. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is it okay if we take a minute? Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I take what's on me. Right now. And Lord, many of these are my spiritual grandchildren. Many of these I've known since birth. I've known them all their life. And Father, in the name of Jesus, 
I stretch my arms out in the Spirit. And Lord, it's like I'm holding a, 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 a big bucket of this anointing on my life. And I offer it to them. In the name of Jesus. Now, in the name of Jesus, receive it. Whew. Receive it. That youth movement's coming. We're getting the anointing to handle it. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. If, if, if you're under 40, stand up. If you're under 40, stand up. Just stretch your hands out. Stretch your hands out. If you're standing, stretch your hands out. Father, I stretch out my hands. I hold this anointing out to them. In the name of Jesus. May they go farther. May they do more. May they accomplish more for the kingdom of God. Father, may they stand on our shoulders and see greatness. Take it now in Jesus' name. Receive it now in the name of Jesus. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. If you're 50 or under, stand up. 50 or under, stand up. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. Now listen to me, girls. Y'all be prepared because there's some counterfeits coming your way. And they're going to look the part and they're going to sound the part. They're not the part. And y'all remember this night. Now, now this is very important. I'm not, I'm, I'm not being hard and I'm not being funny. You better watch those boys. Because when the devil wants to move you away from the plan of God, he brings somebody into your life. And they can look right, sound right, know all the phrases. Check right here. Check right here. You promise? You check right here and you'll be okay. And before you know it, God will bring that man of God into your life that will change everything. Hallelujah. You're 50 and under. Stretch your hands out. Stretch your hands out. Stretch your hands out. Oh, glory to God. Oh, glory to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I stretch my hands out. I offer this anointing. In the name of Jesus, right now, in Jesus' name, take it and receive it in Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Now, there's something, Rusty, there's something you're believing God for. I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me. I don't know what this is all about, and Lord, I'm, I'm cautious. Rusty, I, 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 you know me, and I know you, and, and, and I'm saying this, and I know, I know your heart, and, and it, it, you're a person that this is not going to lift you up, but listen to me. Eye problems. God is going to move through you to lay hands on people with eye problems. And their vision will get corrected and the blind eyes will see. And that's going to be something that is a, a signpost in your life. That the blind can see. And it will serve as evidence that everything else that you lay hands on, God will heal them as well. Don't be ashamed, son. Don't be ashamed. Do it. Lay hands on people. God will heal them. Whew. He needs that equipping. He's got the, the anointing of an evangelist. He needs that equipping. He needs that equipping. Oh, glory to God. If you're 60 or under, stand up tonight. Stand up tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Whew. Stretch your hands out, please. Ha, ha, ha. 
in the name of Jesus. Father, I stretch my hands out tonight. I hold this anointing out. Oh, Father, I feel that. I, I, it's flowing. There is, there is just this warm glow flowing out of my hands right now. It, it feels like liquid, liquid heat. And I see it. Receive it now in the name of Jesus. Now in Jesus' name. <laughs> Julie, your next book's coming. And it's going to be easier than the one you wrote last time. And it's going to be chock full of godly truth. And people are going to read it and they're going to get saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I receive that. I receive that. I receive that. And the, en the enemy's played a game with you over the last two months. And he's tried very hard to get you to back off for whatever reason. And he's used this a lot. What people think. And people this. And people that. The key demarcation of the anointing is a lack of fear of what people think. From this night forward, you won't care. Hallelujah. 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 Now, if, if you're 80 and under, stand up. Amen. Is that God, everybody? Here, here's why I'm telling you. We got all the generations. We have sons and daughters. We have old men and young men. We have servants and handmaidens. Paul talked about those generations. He said, I need the elders because they're steadfast and stable. I need the young men and women because they're strong and, and able to take the race. He said, you young people learn from the older people. He said, older people entreat the young women like, like daughters and like sisters and the young men like sons. That's what we're doing. If you just stood up, stretch your hands out. Because God's not done with you. The Lord told me not too long ago, He said, in 25 years, your next assignment begins. In 25 years, I'll be 78. So I got another assignment in 25 years. <laughs> so praise God, at least I, unless the rapture comes, at least I'll be around for 25 more years. Well, there are people in here, you got your hands up right now, and whatever age you are, your assignment's beginning. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I have my arms outstretched and this anointing's flowing. I offer it to all of the elders in our church right now in the name of Jesus. Take it! Right now in the name of Jesus. And it shall all come to pass. In the name of Jesus. I believe God. I believe God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So here's the key. Whatever he asks you to do, just do it. Whatever he asks you to do, just do it. And you're going to see great things. You're going to see great things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe God. I believe God. Isn't God good to us? Amen. It's so good to see everybody tonight. So grateful for this good turnout. God bless you. We're grateful for everything God has done. Uh, you notice we, we kind of uh, made the aisles a little wider and did some different things. And, and I appreciate you all's willingness to abide by the protocols and put up with the doors being open and and, and different things. We appreciate it. The day's coming. We're not going to have to do that again. But we just got to be patient. We just got to be patient and get through it. And everything will be okay. Amen. I'm telling you, everything will be okay. 
and uh, God is so good to us. And I just want to say publicly uh, that we appreciate so much everybody that came and cleaned, and you can see the carpets were cleaned, and, and uh, uh, the areas were all disinfected and, and deep cleaned, and so we appreciate that, and that, that continues on an ongoing basis, all the surfaces. I just want you to know that we're doing our part in the natural to make sure that people feel confident and feel comfortable uh, in, in, in the place that God has called them to be. And, uh, and I want to also say this as we're closing, and please don't be too hard on people that are having a hard time venturing back out and, and doing things. I mean, you know, uh, uh, we're all at different levels of faith. And if somebody's taking some time, be kind, be considerate, pray for them, you know, uh, 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 be nice. Because we got to be a church that ministers to everybody. And so what we have to do is make sure that, that people are feeling comfortable enough to come back to church and, and we can minister to them and, and the day won't, listen, the day will be here soon, we'll all be shoulder to shoulder again, and, right? And you'll notice that your neighbor didn't wear deodorant and, and uh, you know, we'll, right? You'll be offering them a mint, amen? And if they say, I don't need one, you'll say, yes, you do, amen? Uh, that's what, you know what Buzz's mother told him? Right? When she, before she moved to heaven, if anybody ever offers you a mint, take it. <laughs> Amen. Is that right, Buzz? No, that's exactly right. Amen. Hallelujah. But I, I'm saying that lightheartedly because, because that day is coming, and it's coming rapidly. So let's be patient. Will you be patient with me? Let's just be patient. Amen. And, and the promise will arrive. Amen. And, and uh, you know, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And so if somebody wants to elbow bump or fist bump, just give them the bump you know, and just get it going. Amen. Y'all remember that dance we used to do in the 70s? Y'all don't remember. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, but God's good to us. Praise God. Amen. Look at Kathleen. See, they just did it. Ungodly. Ungodly. Ichabod! <laughs> no, not really. God's so good to us. Amen. And as always, it's so good to have pastors gaz away with us. I went over the other day and, and prayed with them through their building. It is so quickly coming to fruition. And uh, so we're believing God with them. They moved out of their temporary location. And we're believing God that soon they're going to be in their permanent location. Amen. And God's going to do some wonderful things. Amen. Well, come on, say it with me tonight, would you? The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. Don't forget prayer tomorrow night at 7. Thank you for joining us for this message. We would love to hear from you. If you have a prayer request or want to share how this message has helped you, send us an email at main at buildfaith.net. This message and many more materials are available to you free of charge, can be found at buildfaith.net or at any of our location media stores. As always, keep the switch of faith turned on and build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God.